Uh, CP, the franchise, did a great job all year with Nick Fan TV. I saw him go down to Atlanta. He was hanging out with Big Zoo. CP, how you been, pal? Evan, uh, I'm recovering day by day, uh, much better than Wednesday night, so each day gets better. But yeah, shout out to Big Zoo, man. He came down. Uh, we had a large contingent travel with us to Atlanta for games three and four. Wasn't the result that we were looking for, but uh, met, met a lot of cool people, man. So it, it was a good time. Well, here's what I'm curious about. In 2019, the Nets had a similar surprising out of nowhere year. And for me as a fan... Yeah. They got embarrassed in game five. They got more embarrassed than the Knicks did, all right? They got mm-hmm. killed by Philly. And it took me weeks before I was able to carpenta, car, car, well, hold on a second, carpent, carmenta, pentalize, no. <laughs> Compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. There you go, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah, before yeah. I was able to say, all right, that sucked, but this was a really good year and I feel good about the future. Obviously, look, we all know, this was an amazing regular season. No one saw this coming. How has that adjustment been after losing in five to Atlanta? It was tough. Uh, You know, I'm not going to lie to you. It was tough, man, because, you know, I was at the game two when we came from behind and and an epic second half and you know it spilt out onto 7th Avenue you know Knicks fans thousands of Knicks fans just rejoicing you know stopping semi trucks in their tracks it it was incredible and so you know the energy off of that game it just made you feel like they were going to be in this series Um, but having said that having been to games one through four it just became more and more apparent to me that the Hawks just had more talent man and so even though it was hard to see the Knicks go like that I just, you know, came to grips with the fact that the Hawks were just better. In every facet of the game, they were better. Offensively, defensively, rebounding, coaching intangibles. They, they, they were just a better team. And so it was it was not easy, but it, it was, you know, it, it was easier to get over just because they were the better team. Right. Does your view on Julius Randle change based on what yeah. happened? No, because to be honest with you, I always thought that he was going to be a second or third option on a very good team. Now, uh, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, disappointed in his performance. I mean, this guy averaged 37 points per game against the Hawks in their regular season matchup on 58% shooting, 50% from three. Conversely, in this series, he averaged 18 points a game, 30% from uh, field goal percentage, and 33% from three. I mean, the Hawks' defense was great, but I also thought, you know, Randall kind of buckled under the bright light. So it was disappointing to see him go out like that, but. I still know that they need more talent and talent that's better than him to be a serious, serious threat in the playoffs. There were a few things that jumped out of me on adjustments that Thibs could have tried. Now, look, I don't think it was going to make a difference. I think you said it best. Atlanta is a more talented team, and they kind of proved it throughout. Was there anything? Because to me, it was more of Obi and Julius going small, try to get Capella off the court, try to spark this offense a little bit. That and anything else, your view on things that maybe Thibodeau should have tried differently in this series? Yeah, that was a key because Capella really did not have to work defensively in terms of his one-on-one matchups because neither Taj Gibson nor New Orleans Noel were going to be a threat from the perimeter. And so, you know, they were able to guard Julius Randle quite easily, number one, with DeAndre Hunter being a better on-ball defender and then having Clint Capello shadow him. So you would have wanted to have seen them go to Obi in some spurts. Now you're going to lose some on the defensive side and, and, and in terms of rim protection and, and also in terms of rebounding. But offensively, it would have been been nice to see them go to ob uh and julius tandem just to see if they can move capella away from the basket and defensively i was looking for frank nilakina uh in this matchup because the hawks have so much potency on the perimeter whether it's young bogdanovich herder uh Gallinari, you know lou williams they have so many guys that can not only hit the three but that can put the ball on the floor and really stretch a defense and so i was looking that when thibodeau took Peyton out of the rotation that he would find a way to get Neil Aquina in there in 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 spots you know ahead of Bullock maybe in term in maybe even ahead of Barrett sometimes just to get some sort of defensive intensity in there to help slow down this high octane Hawks offense. You know what I was thinking, and I think you disagree with me because I was listening to one of your episodes, and I, I don't think you agree with this, but correct me if I'm wrong. And that was yeah, when yeah. he took Peyton out of the lineup to actually start Frank to keep Rose in that same spot of giving you that spark yeah, off yeah. the bench and actually starting Frank Nilakina as opposed to Alfred Payton. 
it, there, there was a bit of a ripple effect because it did impact the second unit, you know, put more pressure on Alec Burks and Emmanuel quickly to generate offense for that second unit. Later on in the series, even though they did start Rose, I did see them play Rose with that second unit and then even bring in RJ Barrett to kind of help the ball move a little bit. Starting Frank, though, Evan, you know, the times that they did start Frank this season were a complete disaster. He came in in injury duties, uh, in particular in San Antonio, and he came right out within five minutes because there's just not enough ball movement, not enough flow to your offense, and you're stuck moving east and west rather than north and south, which is what Rose can do and really put pressure on a defense. So I think Tibbs' hands were tied, but overall it just spoke to the lack of depth that we had at the point guard position. We're talking to CP, the franchise. Did a great job with Nick Fan TV throughout this season. I jokingly, actually not jokingly, I've told you I always watched your episodes after Nick losses. After wins, <laughs> yeah. I would... <laughs> Sometimes I'd watch afterwards. It, it actually depended yeah, the kind yeah. of mood I was in with the Nets. But after losses, I enjoyed it. And that's not really a knock. It's a compliment because I think a lot of times in sports talk radio and certainly on YouTube, you want to hear what fans say after losses. And you want to see how they feel and what they would do differently, which leads me to this. And I don't know if you feel this way. I think that sometimes these stories are put out there just to get Nick fans to get all excited. Like this, oh, Damian Lillard may be traded. Damian Lillard. To me, it's not going to be traded. Like, he's got four years left on his deal. They're going to basically let him hire the next coach in Portland, which will probably be my guy, Jason Kidd. Do you buy the idea that Damian Lillard could be available? And do you think that this is something the Knicks should be pursuing, kind of that big game hunting yeah, yeah. that we spent you know, a decade basically talking about? I, I can't stand it, F. You know, whether it's the KD Kyrie speculation, it's Zion, it's LeBron, it's Kawhi Leonard. Now, you know, Kawhi Leonard's uncle is a Knicks fan, so maybe he's going to come to the Knicks. And it's, uh, I can't stand it. I was trying to take a vacation. I was trying to take a little breather after this long season. And, and I just went live last night to talk about this Damian Lillard situation. Look, you know, it, it was reported in Yahoo Sports that after they fired Terry Stotts that Damian Lillard prefers Jason Kidd. I think it's a very remote possibility that he would, you know, request a trade and that the Knicks would be in position to get him. You know, right now, the Knicks should be focused on continuing to build with the assets that they have. Yes, they need to improve in a, in a talent standpoint, but gutting the roster to bring a 31-year-old Damian Lillard here, who's going to be owed $48 million at the end of his contract with, you know, nothing else to build with. That's the Carmelo Anthony trade all over again, if you ask me. And so he's my favorite player in the league, Evan. I would love to have him. But, you know, it just that type of trade just does not make sense based on where the Knicks are right now. They need to continue to rebuild and keep building through the draft until they can, you know, make moves in the future. What are you doing tonight at about 730? Um, I'm guessing that's when my Milwaukee Bucks uh, <laughs> take on the New Jersey Nets. And, and I'm you, you, all wait, in. Hold on, hold on. I'm all... <laughs> you say that as if that's a dig. You have to understand. I know that there aren't a ton of diehard fans, and you make that clear sometimes on Twitter. Like, the yeah. comment that really, I don't want to say pissed me off, because I get it. But the comment that annoyed me was like, your parade is going to feature Andrew Yang, Michael Rappaport, and Evan Roberts. <laughs> Spr sprinkling a couple hipsters, you know, a couple techies around Fulton Street, you know. But, the, but the, here's what's funny. The diehard net fan, because there are diehard net fans. Again, I'm not, I'm not one that ever says it's our town or we're taking over. I don't believe that. Yeah. This is a Nick town, and I respect that. But the diehard net fan is a New Jersey net fan. So when yeah. you call us New Jersey, a guy like me doesn't get offended. I'm like, yeah, I think about my days growing up as a Nets fan. Yeah, I, I just like to throw a couple elbows out there whenever I can and tweak whoever I can out there with the New Jersey reference. But, you know, this matchup to me is an NBA Finals matchup because with the Embiid injury in Philly, I think they're out regardless if they make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. And that's not a guarantee the way this Hawks team is playing. But I, I think this Bucks next matchup is going to be a really tight series. I do give the Bucks a chance. I think they're a deep team uh, defensively, offensively. They have a lot of three-point shooting uh, prowess. I think, you know, the way the Nets are going to defend the freak is going to be key in this series. And and so let's see what happens, man. I'm very interested. I will be tuning in at 7.30, Evan. Ha absolutely. And I put out a poll yesterday, and I, I wasn't being sarcastic. I was actually curious because, yeah. obviously, I get a lot of tweets from Nick fans, and most of the tweets are, no one cares about the Nets. That's usually where yeah. it starts. And then there yes. are digs, like, how do you root for this team? Look at the, all these stars, whatever it is. Are yeah. you a Nick fan... 
that is going to sit here like, let's go box, which you just joked about, or maybe it's true. I know you're not ignoring their existence I, I, because you're a diehard basketball fan. Like, that's just not, I can't see that ever being in your blood. So do yeah. you look at this as kind of like the old Met Yankee thing where Met fans spend every October just rooting hard against the Yankees? You hate them and you, you kind of lean into it. Like, yeah, I don't like the Yankees. Is that where you are yeah. with this Net team? Yes. Yes. And, and it's different. You know, listen, when the Mets were in the World Series, I was rooting for the Mets. Back when the Jets had their run with, with Parcells and all that, I always liked the Jets. You know, even though I'm a diehard Giants fan, I always root for the Jets. But, you know, with the Nets, with the whole KD Kyrie situation, spurning the Knicks, KD talking about the Knicks weren't cool. Yeah. I'm rooting for the Bucks. Wes Edens was a diehard, the owner of the Bucks was a diehard Knicks fan. So I'm going with Wes, and I'm going with the freak, Middleton, Drew Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> the Edens part is a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> I'm, I'm grasping for straws, Evan. But yes, anything I can do to support this Bucks team, I'm willing to do it. Dude, I respect it. I mean, I, I, I always try to be honest, like... I watch every Nick game. I try to be fair about it, but I can't stay in your team. And, and you'd understand why. I mean, as a Net fan, you grow up as little brother. You grow up as everybody's a Nick fan. So naturally, you're going to hate the other team. And I, I think that's healthy. I think there are more Nick fans like you that are just going to hate the Nets during this run as opposed to this facade of, well, I don't care. I'm just not going to watch. Who cares? They're irrelevant. I don't even know they're still playing. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm rooting actively against them. And look, with the Lakers being out, and Philadelphia losing Embiid, I'm, like I said, I really see this series as potential NBA Finals. And if they get past the Bucks, I don't see anything stopping them from bringing the title to Brooklyn. And yeah, it would hurt. You know, I'm certainly not trying to see that. So let's go, Greek freak. I'm going Bucks in seven. Let's get it going. You know what scares me about these series? And I think it's because of the experience. It's the little guy that scares me. Obvi- we know how good Giannis is. We don't have to waste our time. How are they going to defend yeah, yeah. him? Hopefully a lot better than the, what they did in the back-to-back where basically Nash said, we'll just give you every shot in the world. Yeah, and they yeah. give him confidence when he starts hitting it. But it's, it's Bryn Forbes that scares me because I watched him during one of the regular season games hit like five threes against us. I remember yeah, Speedy yeah. Claxton in the NBA Finals in 2003. It's those little guys hitting big shots that always scares the crap out of me in a series like this. I, I mentioned it on another show. I said, do not sleep on Bryn Forbes, you know, Connaughton, those type of guys. But I think Middleton is, is really going to be the most important in this series because uh, we saw in the series against the Heat that they relied on him to be their closer. I thought that was the right move by Budenholzer. And and I think his, his productivity in this series is really going to be key in supporting, you know, what Giannis does. Obviously, Giannis has to, you know, put up his production as well. How about the, the renaissance of Brooke Lopez, the, the former net? I'd love to see Brooke Brooke Lopez, you know, get some revenge on his old team. That, that'd be a great story, wouldn't it? That'd be a fantastic story. <laughs> um, who, who do you think wins game seven, by the way, tomorrow between the Clippers and the Mavs? Man, that, this is the most interesting series of the playoffs to me because both teams won on the road. And, you know, you've seen the brilliance of Luka Doncic. He's been absolutely unguardable in this series. But Kawhi Leonard just put on a masterful performance in Game 7. I, you know, I got to lean with the home team. I'll give it to the Clippers, even though I don't like their supporting cast that much. I don't really trust them. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to give it to the Clippers and and count on a, another solid performance by, by Kawhi Leonard, supported by, by uh, Paul Jones. George and, and the home team. I think they'll take it in, an, in another close, close game. Let's get this, and there's a reason I'm asking it. Who do you mm-hmm. want to see win game seven? Who are you rooting for? I got to root for the Clippers. Really? The I, reason I, I, I can't. I, I get yeah. it. I get it. the obvious answer because of Porzingis. I totally understand yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. The yes, reason yes. I ask that with intrigue is if the Clippers get knocked out, you know what's going to happen. Now, I know you don't believe it. But you know it's going to create the, oh, maybe Kawhi opts out talk and gives your team that chance of, hey, maybe Kawhi is going to come to the Knicks. So you're not even giving that enough serious thought to root for Porzingis and the Mavericks against the Clippers in a Game 7. You know, I just can't see Kawhi Leonard flipping around like that. You know, he made the decision to go to the Clippers, a conscious one, because he could have went to the Lakers and and they would have built a dynasty there. He chose to go to the Clippers back home in L.A. to start something on his own. He brought Paul George there. You have Steve Ballmer, who's an absolute nutcase. I think he'll, he'll move heaven and earth to keep Kawhi there. So... I just don't see why, you know, what the incentive would be for him to leave the Clippers, leave more money on the table, and come to the Knicks. 
So, you know, I'm rooting for them. I'm rooting for them. I don't want to see uh, not even Porzingis. Tim Hardaway Jr. is having an electric series for these Mavericks, man. He's been unstoppable. On the game yesterday. It's got Maverick fans convincing uh, Nick fans. Actually, we gave up those first round picks for Hardaway. It's the Tim Hardaway trade, <laughs> yeah. not the Chris Tops Porzingis. Yeah. I, I had a random Mavericks fan leave me a comment on my channel like, thank you for Tim Hardaway Jr. And good good luck with the 21st pick in the draft this year. I said, oh, man. Hey, great job all year. You've done a great job with that YouTube channel. Nick Fans TV for anyone to check out. And uh, thank you for your honesty that you want my basketball team to lose. <laughs> Evan, I always appreciate it, man. Have a great weekend and all the best to you, man. Thanks again. Thank you, man. CP the franchise, Nick Fan TV if you want to check it out.